Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks and welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. I hope you and yours are well. Um, I'm speaking to you today, I'm, I'm on holiday actually and I've not got the greatest internet so I'm hoping, I'm hoping it doesn't affect too much your enjoyment of the show. Um, but we'll press on anyway. Let me get the guy, uh, Lloyd again, the Covid is still not fully recovered. So hopefully he'll be back with us next week um, and uh, we'll be back to the, the, to the true compliment. But in the meantime, I've got to once again thank Alan Petrie up there in Dundee for joining us. Hi, Roddy. Welcome, Alan. Hi, right, thanks very much. Uh, you, you pulled me away from making a buffet for tonight's uh, launch of the Perth uh, Salvo Laku. Oh, I can't even like that. That sounds like good. What are you, what's in the buffet? Coronation chicken, cheese and onion, egg mayo, tuna mayo, uh, quiches, sausage rolls, cheese rolls. Oh, sounds all right. Wouldn't mind that. And down there in Coat Brig, we have got the Cavalier himself. Hi, how you doing? It's a wee bit hectic the day, I have to admit. I'm uh, at my wife's house, soon to be ex-wife. Uh, the furniture movers are in. Um, I'm supposed to be helping, but I forgot. <laughs> got the timings wrong, so uh, movers are here. All right, lads, so this table's about to get shifted at some point, and the dogs are running about barking. Um, obviously, I'm a student of chaos theory, or this wouldn't have happened. But uh, there you go. What are you going to do? Yeah, you got to cry about it. Just crack on, crack on. Dogs barking's a thing in the. Uh, Aye, magic. You think, that, you think that's bad? Look at the chaos I've, I've got to work in. I swam in it, man. <laughs> oh, anyway, I were lucky. I were lucky. Uh, indeed, I'm lucky my, my son spoils me. Um, we've got uh, Eva, who has joined us this week, but um, with a wee bit of sad news for us. Eva, how are you, my friend? I'm in good night, Rosie. Thanks for considering. Thanks. Um, one of the difficulties for us this week was that we lost Matt's mum, Annie Riley. She passed away at the grand old age of 86. Um, she was literally the salt of the earth, one of these wee women that works away, almost behind the scenes, unseen, but the absolute backbone, the spine of Scotland. Everybody's friend looked after the entire family, knitted it all together, literally knitted it together with, the, you know, the booties and the hats and the wee cardigans that she knitted for every new child and grandchild and great-grandchild. She had been a supervisor in the mill. Um, for those folk who remember when Scotland had mills and mill workers and the lassies that were in trouble went to her for advice. If they, they were needy, there was something up, there was a problem with a boss, somebody had taken a loan of them, they had issues in their personal life. She was there, always a shoulder to cry on and a great big warm hug for anybody that ever needed it. So she'll be very, very sadly missed by the family and by many others who have throughout her life. Another nationalist that hasn't lived long enough to see what we all pray for and hope for. Um, and we need to get moving, folks, before we lose more. We're losing too many. We've got to get independence sorted. But this is we're in the coming week, folks. We're coming up to the British budget, the UK budget. And um, we're getting told now that the 22 billion uh, black hole has now become a 40 billion black hole. And uh, so we've been already getting told to get ready to pull those belts in another notch. I'm 72. I've now got a waist the size of Twiggy with the amount of notches I've got in my belt from pulling it in from British uh, economic disasters from one to the other. But we can, of course, lend more money. We lent our 2.6 billion to Ukraine this week. We have given the Israelis 250 free RAF flights to help them target because they're not managing to kill enough, making us all complicit in a genocide, folks. We can afford all those things, but what we can't afford is to give our people a world a, a winter fuel payment or give the waspy women their entitlement that they've paid into all their lives. But here's the thing. Start with you, Eva. I want to just start off with Mr Swinney. It's our UK budget, and here's what he did. Please stick up that video. 
Take it. What is needed now amongst all four nations of the United Kingdom is a collective commitment to public investment for economic renewal. Investment that will allow us to move into an economic spring with new growth, new opportunities and new hope. In this century defined by global crises, we must invest boldly to improve living standards, to increase equality and to protect the planet. We cannot simply sit back and wait for economic conditions to improve after nearly two decades of volatility. Instead, all four nations must be able to become invested. All four nations, Eva. All four nations. This is the man who's meant to be the head of the independence movement. Why hasn't he put out an alternative Scottish budget? In an independent Scotland, here's what we'd be doing in the budget this week. He's talking about the four nations. It's a disgrace. He's continuing the continuity position of his predecessors. That's exactly what he's doing. Um, and the issue for John Swinney is, what is his priority? Because it is clearly not the independence of our country, of our nation. Um, he has no business talking about the four nations of the UK because he should be concerned with only one, the one that, that elected him and his predecessors to achieve our independence, to get self-determination for our country, so that the economic spring that we speak about would be the economic spring occurring within Scotland once it is self-sufficient and we can look after all of our people the way that we could had we full economic autonomy. Now, this is exactly the same as Nicola Sturgeon ranting a few years ago about stopping Brexit when England voted for Brexit and Scotland voted against it. Had she taken action then, or had Hamza Youssef or John Swinney taken cogent real action in the course of the last couple of years, we wouldn't be talking about an economic spring. Scotland would already be rejuvenated because we would control our own resources. And this is the problem. People like John Swinney sold the jerseys. They want to be part of a, a, a devolved government. Now, a devolved government is no government at all. A devolved government is one where somebody else holds the purse strings, and that's the issue. John Swinney is content to go along with that and to employ the Oliver Twist mentality, hand out, waiting for something to come back, the begging bowl, as opposed to growing a pair and being able to fight back against the United Kingdom government and say to the people of Scotland, let's have hope, let's have cogent action, here is a plan, here is a route map to independence. Instead of that, what you've got are SNP politicians, elected politicians, formerly elected politicians and wannabes talking yet again about how there's a surge in the SNP support, how the, the Labour are dropping in the opinion polls, people are coming back to the SNP because they see that independence is the answer. The problem, though, is the SNP are not providing the route map, the mechanism for attaining independence. They have nothing other than to say, vote SNP, independence will happen. They need to join the dots. We need a constitutional convention. We need to see people with ideas and vision and imagination who will transform our country from being the Oliver Twist recipient, hopeful recipient, optimistic recipient with a begging bowl. We have to transform that into the country that takes its destiny into its own hands. And that will not happen if all you get are sound bites from somebody who is clearly happy to be an inhabitant of a colony, which is what Scotland is for as long as we put up with this nonsense. John Swinney is enabling the United Kingdom to continue to treat Scotland with utter disdain. And the best example of that is Grangemouth. My MP, Brian Leishman, hang your head in shame, son. You said, vote Labour, save Grangemouth. I was there with you at the hustings when you made that announcement over and over again. Voting Labour has not saved Grangemouth. The Grangemouth refinery remains destined to close with a loss of thousands of jobs throughout the country. 
That should have been a national campaign that the Scottish government and the Westminster government should have been four square, not just behind, in front of, ploughing money in, ploughing in resources, looking after the people, talking seriously in terms of oil and gas continuing to be refined and, and, and brought ashore in Scotland. That won't happen because people like John Swinney enable it not to happen. They're our enemies, folks. They're not the people that are going to take our country to where we ought to be. And that speech this week said it all. Phil, uh, so I, I was absolutely enraged when I heard them talking about the four nations and here's what we must do. And all that British speak, all that neoliberal speak, would you as, as angry as me? Uh, yeah, uh, this is the continued asset stripping of the UK and we are paying for it. The 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 neoliberal philosophy that is Labour and Tory it makes no difference which cheek of this particular arse you get. The diff there's no difference in the lies are constant as Eva has just illustrated and the folk of uh, that work at Grangemouth uh, will know all too well. John went John Swinney's a con man. Spinny Swinney, 100%. He is of the betrayer ilk. Anyone associated with Nicola has betrayed us. They have not stood up for the people of Scotland. So it's sadly no surprise that he comes out with this garbage. When someone speaks, as John spoke there, he does not speak for the people of Scotland. He speaks as a traitor as you in my book. We need out of this car crash, which we cannot stop. The economy's getting worse. Just look, and this is the thing that if nothing else gets you angry, just look around your communities. My dad gave me some wonderful advice when I was looking at politics. He says, look, out your windy. What do you see? What, what, what are the opportunities in Coatbridge? You know, what, what, what's the education like? What's healthcare like? What are the job prospects? What's the future for your kids going to be? That's how you measure these things. And when you look out and you, you look, poverty is on the increase in Coatbridge. And it wasn't the bonniest to begin with. It's getting worse. And until we do something about it, is, it will continue to get worse. So unless you... that That's the thing that should get you angry most. That's the thing that should get you up on your feet and shouting and fighting for what's right. Because fighting Brexit was a mistake, Joanna Cherry, take note. You know, yeah, everybody, what Nicola was trying to do, instead of jumping on an opportunity, as Napoleon said, do not interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. What did we do? We joined in this nonsense of trying to reverse Brexit. It was, what, like it or lump it, it was a democratic decision of, of England. And what England gets, once England gets, we can't change it. We need to remember that. We don't even get what we vote for in a UK election. I remember the first time I really saw it in, in black and white, or blue, white and red, I think, or black and red, was in the wee blue book. For the minuscule influence Scotland has had on UK general election outcomes. Go check it out, folks. It's almost non-existent. And remember that we haven't voted Tory since 1955. And that we then we got all this austerity and we could do nothing about it. Remember what the spy Daniel Defoe said. We'll give the Scots token representation and, and the powers that be just laugh at us. And John's walking straight into that with his weasel words. You're a weasel. You're looking for Mr. Comfortable, your slippers, comfy slippers. It's like he's borrowed Pete's comfy slippers. They're all happy to stay where they are and get what they want and not give a damn about the people of Scotland. And we should be enraged. John, you betrayed, you betrayed us. And, and, and what you did to Alex Salmond as well, to hell you, John Swinney. You do not deserve to be a, even called or considered considered a leader of the people of Scotland. You're a council, you're a big, you're a big fat council worker filling your boots like everybody else in the Scottish government right now. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's sort of about this whole budget this week coming up, uh, uh, Alan, is that we're told that um, our Chancellor, our new Chancellor Rees, was an economist for the Bank of Scotland. Turns out this week, it turns out she was a, a a supervisor for the customer service department. Now, she lied in her CV, she's lied the whole way through Parliament. Not going to be fired, she's not going to be resigned, but we think that customer supervisor, customer services supervisor, is the one to, to, to solve all the financial problems of the UK. Bizarre. And we are meant to say that Scotland can't look after itself. Well, in any other profession, she should have been sucked for her life. Simple as that. She's not qualified to do the job, so she shouldn't be there. But for Swinney, I mean, what Swinney should be uh, highlighting within the four nations? 
is why England is the only of those na- only one of those nations who does not have a fixed budget that it must keep to. Because what England do is say, we'll spend more money, we'll borrow more money, because Scotland, Wales and Ireland will be paying it off anyway, so we don't care. Just keep spending, spending, we'll do whatever we want. And we all get a small proportion back through the Barnett formula. It's just ridiculous. I mean, Swinney talks about uh, an economic spring. You can't have a spring forward if the spring's made of wood. It's as simple as that. You've, that you cannot spring forward whether you're in this union. And for Swinney to make these outrageous things about growth, I mean, his party in Dundee City Council and one council ward are planning to close two libraries, two community centres and a school and a sports facility. They claim that they're going to put this all into the new super school that they're building. But doing that, that goes against the Cullen Report after the Dumblane Massacre. It's putting school children at risk by having members of the public in a school building at the same time as children being educated. It's ridiculous. The SNP have lost lost all ground, all credibility. And it's time they start putting Scotland first, making sure Scotland, Scottish people know what Scotland can do with all its resources and its macroeconomic policy making. Because without that, people are just going to be doing what they're doing now and not voting. I mean, I believe the last two by-elections was a 15% and a 17%. It's ridiculous. People are just fed up of all the political parties. And it's time we, the people, started getting out in the street and making the, the argument for Scottish independence. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's four or five by-elections down in England this week. And again, the turnout's about 19 20%. The people are switching off. Um, here's the other thing. We're told all the time, Eva, that you know, we're, we're too poor, too stupid, too weak to be you know, the big broad shoulders of the UK. And it came out this week. I think we've got a, uh, a wee picture for it. One in four English councils are likely to go bankrupt in the next two years. Um, the water companies, which we were told when they were privatised, that it would make things so much better, investment, they could do this, they're needing to increase their prices by 84% just to break even, where they're still pouring shit into the rivers and streams in England. Um, when are the Scottish people going to wake up and say, you know what, these people in South Wales, these big broad shoulders are built on sand? You know, the sad aspect of this is that England doesn't have to be bankrupt. England's bankrupt as the result of political choices and political decisions. It's bankrupt because they have a government who won't tax the rich. That's what Labour used to do. They used to tax the rich. They're refusing to do it, and instead they're putting the burden on basically everybody who's not rich is going to have to pay more and benefit less from particularly public services. It is short-sighted and it's wrong-minded. But if that's what the English people want to do, if that's who England want to elect, well, that's up to them. The thing that bugs the hell out of us is that we get the government that England chooses. Scotland doesn't get the government that Scotland chooses. And that's why we need independence for fairness for equality, for democratic purposes, and then watch Scotland not rise, soar. You know, if I was in John Swinney's job, I would like to think that I would have the intellect, the intelligence, the drive, the desire to create a Scottish budget showing folk what Scotland, when independent, creates, makes, fashions, and showing what we could do with those resources and with the fruits of our own labours. As it is, the Scottish fruits of Scottish labours go south to Westminster, and Westminster decides how much comes back, when, and in what manner. And that is signally wrong. It is undemocratic, as we've already said. 1955 is the last time that we elected a Tory government. And I'm saying that deliberately because the government that we've now got is also, to all intents and purposes, Tory. We know this from the nature of the policies that are either already in place or about to be processed. There's a a sort of dressing up of issues regarding workers' rights and workers' entitlement 
But these are these these are pipe dreams that are flagged up just now. Workers' bill introduced to the Parliament, but it's not going to be passed, if at all, for another couple of years. It's window dressing, and it is no more than that. If Labour were serious about redistribution of wealth, they'd be taxing the rich, the thing they've said they won't do. From a Scottish perspective, we need to get the hell out of there, but we're not getting the hell out of there until we've got, as we had in 2013-14, a proper yes campaign. And that needs every shoulder to the wheel. It needs the Constitutional Convention. And most of all, it needs the party of government to actually do what it says on that tin to promote independence at every opportunity. Now, I see this week, the Greens are threatening to bring down the Scottish government over the head of the budget because they don't like what they're doing. They're talking about how the SNP has created a position since the Greens have left the government whereby Scotland is becoming less equal because the agenda the Greens want to pursue apparently from their perspective it is not currently the priority of the Scottish government. Now I think it would be a good thing if the government was brought down and we had an early Scottish election provided that that Scottish election was run on the Scotland United ticket with one pro-independence candidate in every constituency and create the super majority that Alex Salmon spoke about in 2021 that Colette Walker of the Independence for Scotland Party has talked about for years and make our country into the country it should be, a self-determining one where the folk that sit in Holyrood make the decisions that change the lives of everybody in our country but change them for the better, not for the worse, which is what we're going to get with this Labour lot. Everybody knows that. Yeah, but that's the thing. The, this, the theme of this week's prism, uh, Phil, is we're getting, kept getting told to believe the unbelievable. You know, we can't afford to pay the winter fuel payment, but we can afford to kill people in Ukraine and in Palestine. The, um, our Chancellor, yeah, well, she, was a, she wasn't really an economist, she was a supervisor, but she worked in the Bank of Scotland, so she's OK. Um, England, uh, I saw Jackie Bailey this week going on about the NHS in Scotland and how Labour will fix it, and yet you look, the worst performing NHS in the UK is the one in Wales. It's all this lies and smoke and mirrors. But the other one is the UK government, the guy, I mentioned that they're looking for an 84% rise in water prices down south. And folks, if you elect a unionist government in 26 into Holyrood, Scottish water's going the same way. Um, but the UK government minister in charge of uh, the environment, water, took £2,000 of tickets, free football tickets from a water company. He's not been fired. We have to accept it. No one's to say and It's okay. Let's move on. Nothing to see here. Corruption in the UK is rife. Yeah, and it's become the new normal. There used to be at least the illusion of decency where if you did something like that, you would do the right thing and resign. No more. And this this, this goes to the core. You've got to remember what we are and what we've been talking to. have mentioned earlier about Scotland's resources. We've got about 19,000 kilometres of coastline, which is 8% 8, 8 of Europe's coast. That's why our potential for wave is so powerful and wind, offshore wind, is such so massive the area from the from the coast to the economic zone is around six times the size of the land area of scotland you, you, you know when you look at scottish water that's what this is this is what they this is what we've got to remember that uh, scotland's locks and rivers contain 90 percent of the uk surface fresh water and if you go on the environmental scotland website it's got more than 125,000 kilometres of rivers and streams, right? From burns and all fresh water, right? It's the rivers like the Tay and the Don and the Dee. And there's over 30,000 fresh water locks in Scotland, with the Western Isles and Sutherland having the highest concentration. Right? The eight, eight biggest locks cover an area of 301 uh, kilometres squared, almost five times the area of all the rest of the locks combined. Most of the smallest locks in Lochins are in peatland in the northern and western highlands. The larger locks are in the U-shaped valleys, the glaciated valleys. And, and Loch Lomond 
is the largest surface area. Motloch Morar is absolutely huge. It's the deepest at 310 metres. And Loch Ness, and this is the big one that we should remember, holds the most water with 7,452 million cubic metres, which is more than all the English and Welsh lakes combined. So there is, it should come as no surprise that we're a target. And Scottish Water on their site, they still, they're still advertising this. It's a wee bit of a coin, but technically Scottish Water still is in public hands. Okay? So it's supposed to reinvest about 800 million a year in infrastructure to keep it going the way it should do. And this is them telling us this. You know, they've got 4,500 staff, jobs in Scotland, and it's one of our greatest resources. It's even more valuable, will be more valuable than oil. We've got to fight for it. We need to watch this space. If we don't protect ourselves, stand up for our own and stop this nonsense, these shysters from stealing it. And all these English, all these councillors are facing bankruptcy. This is the, this is the modus operandi of, of the current government. Underfund, underfund, put it under pressure, under massive duress, then privatise. The health service is going the same way. Trains have went that way. The post office has went that way. We need to reverse this. We need to we need to create the kind of society that we want to live in, which is one that cares for the people. Reverse the increase in poverty. Let's let's get rid of it. Let's get let's start looking after our kids. Let's give our kids a future. Let's give a damn. Let's stop the greed and the rape and pillage of what little we've got left because they, they'll get it. They're coming for it and they're doing it right now and they're going to take Scottish water. It's just a matter of time. And, you know, you think it's bad now? It can only get worse under the UK and the way these neocons are, are, are operating. We need to stand up and be counted and we need to do it soon. Absolutely. Yeah, Alan, here's the thing. Phil touched on it there. He says, you know, we should be pr promoting the society we want. And I go back to what I said at the beginning. That's exactly what John Swinney should be doing this week. He should have been talking, giving the information, for example, like uh, Phil did there on water, like we had in housing not so long ago from Alec Neal. He should be talking, this is what we can be doing instead of this budget that's coming down, which is, again, I go back to it. My notches are in so far after 72 years on this earth. I can't pull it much tighter. But that's what we need to do. We need to project what we can do with independence, not just say, use it as a label and say, oh, independence will be great. We need to get into facts, and that those facts need to go to the people. Totally agree. I mean, until we get the facts out there, people are always going to believe Westminster. And we've got to do it in a way that it's not just it's Westminster's fault. It's got to be positive. Here's what we can do. The reason we're not being able to do it is because we don't have the powers at our disposal at this present time. But what kind of society lives where our children, our el elderly and our vulnerable are relying on charities that we are all putting money into to help support while our government are using our tax money to pay for bombs and help in genocidal regimes? I don't believe there's anyone in Scotland would support that regime. So why are you continuously voting for these people? You've got to really look at the whole picture of what you're doing when you're going down to vote. If you want Scottish independence, vote for it. Don't vote against a political party because you don't like them. Vote for independence because otherwise you're voting for the union. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And on that, Eva, I mean, my, my views on war are, are, are well known. I'm a pacifist and I don't believe in wars. And I don't, I don't believe in buying a poppy either. We're coming into that poppy season. Um, I just don't agree with it. I'm sorry because we've, we've <laughs> it, it's been abused, in my opinion. And we're going to have all these uh, uh, politicians standing at the, the Cenotaph on the, the, first, the Sunday nearest to November the 11th, talking, you know, how our brave boys who defeated fascism, and now we're supporting fascism. I just can't go that hypocrisy. But what really got me this week, I don't know if you saw it, Evie, or not, the Royal British Legion spent the equivalent of 80,000 poppies on diversity initiatives, and they're offering a job for someone at the head of diversity to pay them £67,437 a year diversity with the British Legion remembering the, the fallen over the years. Explain to me why they need a diversity officer because I can't understand it, Eva. Join the club. They don't need a diversity or equality or inclusion officer at all. They're just 
jumping on the bandwagon that most other agencies, charities, organisations, public services, local authorities jumped on a while ago. Thankfully, some of them are jumping back off. So the Royal British Legion is a wee bit late to the game. You know, quite frankly, and I suppose I'll get pelters for this, we think that the British Legion is about looking after those who gave their limbs or their lives or their families, looking after the families of those who gave their lives in the service of their country or, you know, fighting against fascism or fighting against the forces of evil. What we didn't think the Royal British Legion was about was promoting men in high heels and lipstick. But that's what we've got to. That's where we are. It is utterly and completely wrong. Shouldn't it be happening? That Pride Progress flag is not about pride. It's not about LGB people. It's not about equality. Using the Progress flag is about men invading women's spaces. That's all it means. That's all you see when you see that now. It's a red rag to a bull and it is wrong-minded and it's a, a, a very bad move by the Royal British Legion, as is evident by the, the, the reactions that they've had on social media. So I sincerely hope that they change their mind. But what they're doing in employing EDI officers is what everybody else has done in all these other places. They're spending money on stuff that is completely wrong. It's guff. It's divisive. It is probably in most part, in large part, illegal. Um, they are using unlawful definitions. They are using that mantra that trans women are women. Trans women will never be women, but it's a useful tool for tools to use. And that's exactly what's happening. And it's really got to stop. It's insulting and it's offensive. Uh, here's the thing, Phil. I talk to my father who went on the first day after the war, September the 3rd, he went in the 4th and signed up. That whole generation... These boys didn't go so that people in high heels could get, you know, part of the British Army. It's not, it's absolutely ridiculous. Now, 20% of the people, homeless people in the UK are apparently ex-servicemen. Would we not be better spending the money on them? Is that not what it's meant to be about? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate of this. I mean, there, there, are, there are the brave service people who died in legal righteous wars, such as World War II. But what of those who murdered the innocent in illegal wars? Sorry, you've got to you've got to look at the broad spectrum of what's happening. And our people, I don't blame the service men and women that go and they do as they're told. But if you're put in to do something that's wrong, uh, and oppress another people, then you still need to look. You don't get wrong. You still need to be looked after because it's a damaging thing psychologically and physically. Um, so we still need to look after the, those that, that that do this for us. But it's a white poppy for me. I won't wear a red one. And that's what my grandfather and grandfather's generations fought for. It includes the right not to wear a red poppy. Freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom not to do what you're telling. And I think, I agree, I think the, the whole red poppy, like uh, Hope for Heroes a wee bit as well, has been hijacked by the warmongers. So white poppy for me. I support places that do care properly. And uh, for ex-servicemen and women, places like Erskine Hospital. But what we should be doing is fighting poverty. That's what we should be fighting. That's what's causing the shortcomings everywhere. It, it's it's absolutely it's killing people, and ex service men and women are no different for anybody else, and um, except that there's maybe a need that we as a nation have imposed upon them um, by putting them through the psychology of dealing with death and dishing out death and war and some of the evil that is done in our name by those who put our men and women in the front lines to fight battles and kill people we, sh we have no business engaging with that we should not be there so it, it's the, the ones that really carry the blame for me are the government and the individuals who are victims of this and then we're all, there's, there's some nasty people in, in the military as well some people have done some evil things let's not just pretend it's the other side that only do the bad things if you're in a war situation, bad shit happens. So it's, it's a hell of a thing to deal with, but um, no, places like Erskine Hospital, that's where the support should go. Yeah, it goes back to what I said at the beginning of the show, that there's a, uh, the RAF, it's been announced that the RAF have flown 250 
missions over uh, Gaza, and they're saying, oh, yeah, it was to look for the hostages. No, it was for targeting purposes. And it's no excuse for the boys who are flying those planes. They've been complicit in a genocide. You can't say I was following orders. I think we sorted that one back in 1945. Alan, um, a diversity officer for the Royal British Legion, do you have any understanding or can accept that in any way, shape or form? No, it seems to be this thing where if you want to create a job, put a rainbow flag on it and you'll get a job. I mean, if you think about this, poppies, normal people put about a pound into the box to buy a poppy. That's six hundred uh, sixty-seven thousand four hundred thirty-seven poppies that have to be sold just to pay this individual. Not one penny of your money is going to where you think it's going to go. So maybe start thinking about whether it is worthwhile paying just for someone's job. Because charity should be going to those who are needing it, not to pay somebody's job for a job that shouldn't exist. It is just ridiculous. And it's not just this charity that's doing that. Lots of charities are doing that. I mean, the British Heart Foundation, uh, Cancer Research, their COEs are on extortionate wages. And for the first £100,000 of donations that's brought in, pay their wages. That's not what we give that money for. We give that money for cures. That's and it's ridiculous. That has to change. We speak this week and every week about the problems we have in Scotland. We have we have poverty, a terrible poverty. We have unemployment. We have drug deaths. We have so much going on, and we need independence. We believe that's our opinion now. We believe we need independence, and the government we have always voted for, the SNP, are meant to be doing something about that. But what did they do this week? Techie, stick it up. They decided to declare, they put all their efforts in to declaring that there are 24 genders. Now, as I've often said on here, I'm not the smartest person in the block either, but to me there's three, male, female, and neuter. What are these 24? Do you want to explain them to me, run them through me? What is this nonsense? I'm struggling for words because I, I just I, I just quite want to swear about this because I can't take any more of this nonsense. I've had enough of this. We've had it year after year after year of this complete and utter made-up, piffle, drivel, nonsense, complete shite, quite frankly, is what it is. There's no point in, in trying to sugarcoat it. That's exactly what it is. It is garbage. Um laughing stock of the world that's what scotland should be on the basis of that um that that's guidance to public bodies and public services and all different sorts of agencies that are required to record a gender no you don't have to record gender in the real world where rational sane people live you record sex and you give people two choices because that's all there are you're either male or you're female there is nothing else Gender is a social construct. It doesn't exist. It's like fairy dust and rainbow sparkles. It is a figment of the imagination. And those people who say that they're not male or female because they're non-binary or one of the other 23 genders that you've listed there, these people require help. They require interventions because they're not right. Very simple, very straightforward. We're all born either male or female end off. There is no other way to be. And you're not assigned a gender at birth. Your sex is noted and it is recorded. And that's the truth. Because you see, as soon as people start to lie to you about something as basic as whether you're male or female, they're going to lie to you about everything else that's either to their benefit to lie about or they think they can get away with it. And the gender situation is just a pretty stark example of that and it ill behoves John Swinney in particular to allow that information to be in the public domain and at large because it's only a few weeks ago that he was asked that very question about how many genders are there and he said well in his opinion there's only two well he's right there are only two and he needs to do something about it he needs to withdraw that advice immediately he needs to ensure that the findings of the cash review are actually implemented throughout Scotland. 
He needs to ensure that Stonewall and mermaids have no traction and no influence in Scotland. And he has to get back to the basics of saying that men cannot become women and vice versa. And children, impressionable children and teenagers in schools ought not to be subject to the transgender guidance that is now um, out there. It's extant. It's been there for a long time. And again, it's drivel but it follows along the line of the 24 genders. It's a distraction. It's taking people's eye off the ball. And the ball in Scotland is, not only do we have a Westminster government that is hell-bent on continuing an austerity programme and making it worse, they're targeting people that they consider ought to be working who are lazy because they're overweight and they're on the dole, so they need to get these government... Um, manifest injections to get them you know to lose weight and start working again that's the ethos from from labor in in westminster but the ethos in scotland is that the snp government are so incompetent that they expect themselves to continue to be rewarded by the electorate for making a hash of things whether it's the nhs or education or as we've said so many times before housing social work no, every aspect of public service, public life in Scotland is really wounded below the watermark and nobody is trying to make it better. Instead, they're developing the woke agenda, continuing with the gender rubbish and not addressing any of the stuff that needs to be addressed holistically and properly. You know, you, you see on Twitter every day folks saying, I couldn't vote SNP. Thank God we weren't independent in 2014 because look what a mess they would have made of the country. Were we independent? And that's where the SNP should hang their heads in shame. They need to deliver competent government so that people remember that Scotland is actually able to deliver when we're able to do it by ourselves. And coming out with this sort of stuff looks like a very deliberate move to wound the independence movement in the fashion that they've been doing for the last 10 years. Phil, so when I looked at this twenty, I mean, I don't even know what these are. I, I, I'm, I'm just I say, I'm, I just, I'm, I'm bamboozled by it all. I go back, I think there's three. I go back to male, female, and neuter. Now, why can't they just say if they don't want to be part of the male and female, why can't they just grab neuter and say, well, I'm neuter? Then I'm, I'm neither anything. What, what's wrong with it? instead of having this? What is it? I'm a lap dog's whatever. I'm a reindeer or whatever the nonsense they put. Phil, you're muted. Maybe he's frozen there. He doesn't seem to be moving much. Can you? You're muted there, Phil. Can you unmute yourself? I'll go to you, Alan. Can you? Can you perhaps answer that? Yeah. Well, I mean, like you, Roddy. If there's going to be genders, I think there's going to be three, but my three is slightly different from yours. I believe in male, female, and politician, because there seems to be more women with balls in that parliament than there is with men. But, I mean, as you can imagine, I got lots of forums from the NHS and schools, and every single one of these forums have gender on it. I score that out immediately and write in six, because gender is just a word. It doesn't mean anything. You have to continuously refuse to accept it and score it out and write sex onto it because that, that's the only way we're going to be able to do things and get things to change but I also believe that these 24 new genders are trying to buy off the Greens to save their jobs in the Parliament I think that's I'm just trying to ease in so the Greens will come back on board with them so they can keep their jobs for a little bit longer because they know if there's an election now half of them have lost their seats and they shouldn't be run government like that. They should be running government for the people, by the people. That's what they're elected for. And it does no good to the Scottish independence movement when they are just trying to appease what is effectively a unionist party of the Greens, because they are not an independence party. They have used the independence movement to get their list votes for many years, but people are now waking up to them as a unionist party.
Right, we'll try again. Phil, can you unmute yourself now, mate? Or are you still? I know, I was feeling that the movers are here. <laughs> it's like we're going to take a table. I says, think he's a wee minute. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, ah, it's just one of these things. It's just life. But no, nah, um, right, what, what's the question? Because I was talking to the movers. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm saying that. Oh, you're mute now, Roddy. All of a sudden. Male, male, female, male, female, and neuter. If you don't want to be male, you don't want to be female. Why not just go neuter instead of all this twenty-four nonsense? I it's pandering to um, issues that we shouldn't be really worried about, and um, and I know it's real for some people. A lot of people are going through tough, tough times, but um, at the same token. We we can't change. I mean, you, you cannot dictate to me how I speak and what words I can say and will use. That's freedom of speech is the most important by a distance. There's no doubt about it. So that's absolutely critical. And we have to mo focus on that and remember that is the most important right. Freedom of speech is the right, after all, which we protect all other rights. Um, and uh, you cannot dictate to me which pronoun you use. I, I, it's a matter of my choice and as a decent human being I will if someone's clearly get issues if someone's a man who wants to be treated as a woman then then I will I will respect that individual's rights you know not a problem but it's it's my choice you can't dictate to people what to think and what to say in such matters and on these things Eva I, I go back to it on the theme of we've not to know or we've just to accept lies um, Tech, you're going to stick up the one with the MOD, who are the Ministry of, De of Defence, who are blocking the Scottish Government from releasing any information on numerous, numerous uh, nuclear releases uh, in Coolport and the Clyde. We don't know how polluted the Clyde is now, but we're not to know because the MOD say, oh, it'd be terrible to know. Why is it terrible to know? Why is there secrecy? If it's happening, it's happening. Surely the people should be warned. Maybe they shouldn't be taking their kids down there for a paddle. Maybe they shouldn't be getting mussels off the, the, the sea. Surely to God we're allowed to know this. It's just a continuation. The mushroom mentality, isn't it? Feed us shit and keep us in the dark. And if they think that we're that bloody stupid and supine that we'll tolerate it, well, these days are gone. Um, the people of Scotland won't tolerate this. We know perfectly well that the information about you know pollution on the Clyde is not being released because SEPA don't want it released. They could release it if they want, but they're not going to do it. The reason they won't do it is the statistics are, are woeful, absolutely woeful in terms of the actual contamination and the potential contamination. And it simply confirms what we've known all along. If it were safe to have weapons of mass destruction and nuclear subs on, on the Clyde, then they wouldn't be on the Clyde. They would be down in Portsmouth or Plymouth or they would be rammed up the Thames, which is exactly where they should be. They should be parked outside the Palace of Westminster. Um, I would put them there tomorrow if I could. And this is just simply confirmation of what we've all known forever, that these are dangerous, that Scottish waters are polluted and that they are... a. Uh, you know, a huge suppurating boil of pus on the surface of Scotland that requires to be moved forthwith out of our waters, preferably removed from the surface of the earth. But at the moment, just sailing them south and sticking them up the Thames would do me fine for starters. Uh, I feel that the fact is that these uh, things which we don't we don't want in our waters. Um, but I, I've been a great believer. I remember, when, for example, when they wanted to have safe consumption rooms and the UK government said no. I said, do it. Tell them to piss off. Just do it. Annoy them. Do everything. Keep pushing, them, pushing it as far. When they turned around and said, no, don't release the information, the Scottish government have said, stuff you. We're releasing it. What are you going to do about it? Invade us? Send us to jail? What are you going to do? We should, the Scottish government should grow up here and release the information to hell with bend, bowing and, and bending the knee to, to London and the Ministry of Defence. Oh, that's absolutely true. I mean, in mid-September, we were all nearly destroyed in a nuclear war, life and earth gone. If Stammer had Biden had allowed Storm Shadow and the US equivalent to be used by the con man Zelensky's 
government um, and to indirect so, uh, attack on Russia, which meant it would have British and American hands on these weapons, helping the guidance systems and control co uh, release codes, launch codes, etc. Uh, you cannot launch these weapons without the British military and the American military being involved. Had they went ahead, the Russians were very clear, they will strike targets in Britain and Europe and America because that means we have declared effectively war on them. And thankfully, these two shysters, these two con men, these two puppets, they are puppets of what President Eisenhower, and if, if, if we look, I haven't read it all, but I've read excerpts from his daughter's um, autobiography of her father's life. And he was a, a famous, obviously, World War II general who became president. And he was more general than president. And he warned in his farewell speech of the rise of the military industrial complex and its hunger for war and that it is driving war, not the government. And that's something that we going forward have to be very, very careful with. Absolutely. We in Scotland, they're out the way. Say that it's, it's up there in Scotland, away from um, mass population centres. What, 35 miles from Scotland's biggest city? We don't count. Remember that, people. We do not count. I mean, I'm quite happy to send a back in an independent Scotland airmail, if you like. But um, no, no, <laughs> we'll have none of that. But, you know, we should get them back down the road. Um, if you want them, you keep them in your garage. Put them, put them under number 10. There you go. How about that? And see if, if you want to be a nuclear power, you know, face the consequences. I'm more extreme than you. I'd put them on eBay. One careful owner. Who wants them? Take them. They're yours. Come, you know, just put, collect them, take them with you. Off you go. See how they do it then. Alan, the fact, shouldn't the Scottish government just say, to hell with you, we're announcing it's our people who could be getting cancer. Let's be honest, this could be creating cancers, shortening lives, polluting our waters for centuries to come. They should turn around and say, MOD, get stuffed. or telling the people. Yeah, they certainly should be. I mean, who knew it wasn't the nuclear waste that was a danger? It was information about it that was a danger. I mean, remember, it's not the first time they've done this. The Macron report. Anything that would support Scotland running its own affairs is always suppressed. Westminster do not want the people to know about it. Because if we know how badly they treat us and how badly they endanger us, nobody would be supporting this union. And it is as simple as that. But the Scottish government really have to grow a spine. I mean, there's no point in blaming Westminster for all the small things that are happening and letting them off with these major issues. They're endangering our public. The public must know. Here, here, here. Quite well said, Alan. Uh, Techie, now, I, I sent you on the WhatsApp, <laughs> hey, Techie, the, the headline from the National tomorrow. Can you stick that one up? Because there's two things on it I want to discuss. The UK block grant to Scotland is six billion less than in 2020, Eva. And I want to discuss that, but it's going down all the time. But do you see the wee bit at the top there about independence? It's at 52 percent, Eva. Even with all the 24 genders and being devolutionists and all the stuff that's going on, 52 percent of the Scottish people still want independence. All we need is a method and the political will. And I'm just going to confirm to you why it is that we're not going to get either the method or the political will from the SNP, because literally hot off the press is the release of the legal advice given to the Scottish government and Scottish ministers in respect of the Scottish Information Commissioner's case to do with um, the reporting of Nicola Sturgeon, her investigation, by Mr Hamilton. And what's notable from that release, which happens on a Saturday morning when they think people aren't watching, is that page after page, column after column, appears the word redacted. And this is why we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the SNP have lost their way and they're not going to take us to independence and they have to be booted out of the park. They are not in it for independence, they're in it for self-interest in the main. The leadership certainly is. Perhaps some of the grassroots support independence and there are 
doughty members of the party, including, for example, Douglas Chapman and Joanna Cherry, who are there for the right reasons. But these people are not in power. They are not in control. If the SNP were run by Douglas Chapman, Joanna Cherry, Alec Neil, people like that, Phil or Lloyd, we would be in a different country, we would be in a different world, we would be transforming Scotland on a daily basis, we would be meeting as a convention, as a people, we'd be talking about democracy, and that 52% wouldn't stick at 52, it would be 62. You would have people in their droves on the streets campaigning and arguing and fighting and struggling for independence because they would have leaders in whom they could put their trust. And that's why the loss of Alex Salmond is, on the one hand, so terribly painful and raw and sore. But on the other hand, it reminds us all of the hope that, that we had in 2014 and the hope that we need to have again. We just need to take control, take charge and start to show the people of Scotland how to deliver independence. And if our leaders in the SNP and the Scottish Government are not going to do it, then the rest of us step up to the plate and we show them what to do and we do it by ourselves, for ourselves. You know, that's that's the Sinn Féin motto, and they're right. We have to do it by ourselves because, by God, the leaders of the SNP have made it pretty plain. They're not doing it. They're committing as many sins as, as Westminster are in terms of secrecy and, you know, don't do as I do, do as I say. That mentality, that has no place in Scottish politics anymore, especially when you see that, We've got the challenge to the winter fuel payment that is proceeding through the courts. The court of session has said earlier this week that the case is a valid one, it's a competent one, it is highly relevant and it has prospects of success. But the hearing, the full hearing on that won't happen until January. In the meantime, the applicants, two pensioners from, from your neck of the woods, Phil, they're waiting for the legal aid application to be granted because the Legal Aid Board are still considering their application. If ever there was a case for an immediate grant of legal aid, that's it. So come on, you folk at the Scottish Legal Aid Board that I argue with daily, day in and day out. Get the job done, get legal aid granted, bring the case forward, hear it before the winter, or grant an interim interdict meantime, prohibiting the implementation of the policy, stealing the winter fuel payment from those pensioners who can ill afford to lose it. Were Scotland independent, we wouldn't be having this discussion because we would have cheap and at times free energy because we would be self-sufficient in energy and pensioners wouldn't have to pay a ransom, a king's ransom for it. By the way, on the subject of the king, who obviously got himself sorted out by the Australians. Unfortunately, he's gone elsewhere in the Southern Hemisphere and they've lauded them. You know, what planet are these folk living on, thinking that there's something wonderful about a king coming to lord it over them? And Keir Stanmer's over there with them. You know, time to get out, you know, let's get a move on. Let's scoot. Sharp exit. Great. Five topics in one area, you're a star. Well, let's go through them all, Phil. I want you to do the same too. It's fifty-two percent for Indy, Mister Mister uh, Swinney's redactions coming into things, and the pensioners. If the legal aid won't do it, to the, I would suggest, and even can tell we can. Let's let's crowdfund it. I think we could crowdfund that easily, and I think we would get a result. Absolutely agree. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'll commit to that, uh, crowdfund that for the pensioners. It's absolutely wonderful. I, I read about that story. It's, it's, it was heartwarming. Um, and if ever, if, if legal aid are truly there to help those that can't afford uh, to do what is right and to fight a righteous cause, and they don't do this, then there's something very, very wrong here. Um, uh, no, Eva absolutely nailed all of those. Um, Starmer and the King, waste of time, not a royalist, uh, complete waste of time. Um, are we, uh, we'll talk about BRICS as well, because that is the big news that nobody's getting. Sorry. Are we we'll coming up next, Phil? All oh, right, okay. <laughs> Right for me, the, all, all of these issues are, are absolutely gold, and 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 uh, Eva Eva nailed it. To be honest, I'm going to waste a lot of time talking about it because, quite frankly, Eva's nailed it, and I completely agree. So it's like, what's the point? Let's move on. 
Uh, Alan, 52% in favour of independence. Um, we really need to drive this home. And I agree with Eva, which you'll find surprising. I think that we get 60, up to 70% if we actually got campaigning. So I think we, in this programme, are needing to come up with a wee something to pull things together and get something going. If the SNP don't want to be there, then don't be there. But 52 is encouraging. Certainly is. And I think that is, I mean, even really nailed it. Because 52% is what we're being told by Union Express. That's going to be higher. That's definitely going to be higher. But let's even look back to 2014 and the difference between 2014 and now. I mean, I'll go to the difference first. For since 2014, we have left up to the politicians and they have done absolutely nothing. Go back to 2014. Dundee had the highest vote for independence. How did that happen? Not through political parties, because we had people like Bob Costello, Tony Cox, Deb Brown out on the streets speaking to the people, the ordinary people who have never voted before giving them the anger to sign up to vote and giving them the hope to come out and vote. And that's how Dundee got a high percentage. And that's what we must do again. We've got to get out on the streets, get our message, bypass the political parties and get people, give them the anger to register and the hope to vote. Yeah, and also someone to vote for. Indies for Indy. Um, or any Peter Bell or ISP or Alapa, whatever. But we need to unite with those ones and get united and have a united front. A couple of things I want to pull together. One, the other one, Plaid Cymru this week, Eva, um, called out for a, a boycott of Israel, um, as does the Republic of Ireland, boycotts, and treat them as a pariah state, get them out of the way. SNP, silent. It's quite disgraceful. I don't really know where to start with this, because we've watched this, not just for the last year, we've watched it for a lot longer than that. And I can't understand, regardless of their rights or their wrongs or, you know, who started it or, you know, whatever next steps were taken and by whom they were taken, I can't understand why we're watching innocent civilians being bombed and blasted and maimed and the world is not just standing by. The UK is actively participating in this. You know, you've said already about money that's going to the Ukraine. Well, we know perfectly well that there's money and weapons going to Israel. We know there are flights that are taken off from Scottish airports that are aiding and assisting the Israeli war effort. Now, that was not the subject of any democratic decision by the people of the United Kingdom. It wasn't the subject of any vote within Westminster. It's been something that's been done by stealth. And it's been done by our leaders because they wish to pursue the American idea of supporting Israel. And to know that your country, unfortunately for now, the United Kingdom, is actively participating in what is officially a genocide is the most shameful of emotions. Now, like, like the rest of you, my mum and dad were born and grew up through the Second World War and I learned things watching the world at war on the telly, hiding behind the couch and seeing atrocities that, that, that were conducted and I learned things from my mum and dad about what their parents had seen when they fought in the war and why they fought in the Second World War particularly. And I just find it, like every right-minded person, like probably practically every person on the planet, absolutely abhorrent that these atrocities continue to be conducted on a daily basis. You're not talking about some sort of clean war where somebody gets a bullet to the head. You're talking in terms of wee bairns getting their feet blasted off. You're talking about one particular guy, a surgeon, who had to amputate without anaesthetic his own child's leg to try to save that wee lassie's life. These things ought not to happen, and the only reason that they are happening is because America is bolstered by the United Kingdom and some of the UK allies. If if the UK, if the Scottish Parliament, if Westminster, if the people in there actually had guts and determination and a shred, a shred of humanity, 
they would put a stop to this today. The fact that they don't tells you all you need to know about their agenda and their blood curdling and their bloodthirstiness and their absolute and complete total disregard for humanity and the value of human life and the cost of human suffering. Absolutely, and I'd say in an independent Scotland, we certainly wouldn't be involved in it. I would hope we'd be like Ireland and be a neutral country. I certainly hope so. But on that, uh, Phil, and the ICC chief, Karim Khan, who uh, requested the warrants to arrest Netanyahu and Gallant, and lo and behold, suddenly out of left field comes sexual crimes um, against the man. And we also hear that a lot of the judges um, are uh, taking sick rather than signing the warrants. They're all taking sick. They're worried, you know, they don't feel well because they've been told by the Israelis, you sign it, you die. It's as simple as that. It's absolutely appalling. Yeah, it's, it's, it's blackmail. It's, it's what the world's... The, the open bullying is now there for those to see, if you look. And, I, you know, we should be doing... Plaid Cymru calls for that boycott. We should be doing what uh, Sinn Féin are doing. Sinn Féin are a proper representation of the people, as now are Plaid. Plaid Cymru used to follow what the SNP were doing. But under Nicola Quisling, Humza Useless, John Spinney and Angus Robertson and the rest, we have regressed so much that we now look to Plaid Cymru for leadership and what, to do what is right. That's an absolute disgrace. That regression is not acceptable. And then there's, there's I mean, there is no price for taking on that. But there's no price in your conscience. But there is always a price for taking on the powers that be. What you just mentioned there. Ask Julian Assange. Ask Alex Salmond, Craig Murray, Sarah Wilkinson, Richard Medhurst. Everybody who's spoken out and taken on the powers that be, they pay a price. Um, but the what they fear is us to do this together. If we stick together and stand by each other, that is what is feared. The governments cannot stand that. They cannot stand up to it, and that's what we need to do simple as that. I want to for one final question in after this one, uh, Alan. So a quick response is about Plaid Cymru. The SNP should be doing the same. We should be calling for a boycott of Israel. They certainly should. And if they don't, they're hypocrites. Because they've just expelled John Mason from the SNP for making comments on Israel. So if they are saying that John Mason has to be expelled for refusing to accept the genocide in Israel, why are they accepting the genocide? by refusing to boycott any Israeli products. That's the real issue here. We all know Israel is committing genocide and they must be taken to task for that. Now, we are told by the Western media that the enemies of peace are Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Russia. No, they're not. The enemies of peace are the United States of America and Israel. And it's maybe time that the United States of America has broken up in the same way as the USSR were, because then we might have peace in this world. Yeah, I should also say those countries they tell us that you've mentioned in uh, Russia, China, uh, Democratic Republic of North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan and Iraq, what don't they also have? They don't have a Rothschild Central Bank. That's just a coincidence. You know what I'm like with coincidences, Phil. Right, the last question coming up, you, you wanted to, I know you wanted to talk on it, is this week um, we had uh, the BRICS conference, Phil. Um, Mr. Isolated Putin, with the uh, leaders of more than half the world's population, and they're queuing up now another 30 or are, are wanting to join up BRICS. It is the future. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the biggest news that the people of the West are not being told about. BRICS is rapidly becoming the new world order. The BRICS conference was held in Razan, uh, 22nd to the 24th or 25th, I think, this week, um, in Russia, just east of uh, Moscow. Well, quite a distance east of Moscow, considering the size of Russia. But the BRICS conference had 38 heads of state and 23 new al applicants. You've got to go elsewhere for your news, folks. For example, the one I'm quoting today is Al Jazeera, a great source for alternative views of the world other than the mainstream media sources. So they reported that Russia's BRICS summit, what's on the agenda and why it matters to Putin and the planet? The summit which is leaders from two dozen nations they will attend, is the largest event Russia has hosted in years and a signal to the West amid the war in Ukraine uh, that the world is changing. Russia's president is holding this BRICS summit 
Tuesday the 22nd uh, in Russia's southwestern city of Kazan, as I said, just east of Moscow. The three-day conclave will be the largest gathering of world leaders in Russia in decades, and it will be held during this war. I mean, a few. what we need to bear in mind, a few years ago, that, that there's a... They've taken it seriously. A few years ago when Turkey asked to join, they stalled saying, look, we're not ready for expansion as we've not sorted ourselves out. So previously it was just a big conference, but now it's organised as G7 is organised, i.e. the economic ministers meet first to to agree on strategy. Defence meets, the diplomats meet, and then the strategies are all set out for the leaders when they meet to ratify or agree and ratify. This is rapidly becoming the new world order. And for people that don't know what BRICS is, it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, in South Africa. Started in 2006, Brazil, Russia and India, China convened. In 2009, South Africa joined a year later and this is the 16th summit. It now, uh, the BRICS extended invitations to include Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi, United Arab Emirates and after these countries applied for membership, Saudi's yet to formally join but the others have. The invitation is extended to Argentina South American turned it down um, after uh, Millier was elected in December, but he would bolster ties with the West. That's what he's he, they're kind of stalling. But two dozen world leaders attended, and it is expanding. And you're talking about the leaders of India, Modi, Chinese Xi Jinping, South Africa's Ramphosa are attending the summit. Leaders of several other countries, Erdogan's there, the Vietnamese Prime Minister Pam Min Chang, the Brazilian President Fel Mazils, whose foreign ministers attending, and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is also attending, and I believe met Putin on Thursday. This is the New World Order. They will control energy, they will control um, finance, and they're coming out with a new basket of currencies that will change the current leadership of the petrodollar and the states of the petrodollar. We do not have to deal in dollars anymore, and even SWIFT is being bypassed. There's so much in this. It's a programme on its own. It's absolutely staggering. The world is changing, friends. The world is changing. I'm dying to say this. You're on mute, mute, don't you? I call call myself a quid. Um, uh, Another thing that um, Putin said he was the reform of the UN Security Council. It was okay for the last century, and he's brought into this century, bringing in Latin America, Africa, and Asia need to be represented on the Security Council. And of course, um, America is saying anyone who joins BRICS or joins this new currency, the new, the, the equivalent of SWIFT. Um, are anti-democratic. Yeah, yeah, we know you and your democracy, America. We know all about it. Right, folks, the clock's beating us as always, um, and time is running out. So I would like to thank you all for being here today. And may I say to all you who are watching, I hope you've enjoyed this. And I hope some of the internet things we had, we few wee blips here, I hope it hasn't ruined your... Actually, I think it was more trouble in Cote Bridge than there was here in the Maldives, but there you go. Um, may you all... Keep safe and yours too. Till we see you again, take care. Through a Scottish prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.